Good morning and welcome to our online worship service for this Sunday of Pentecost. I would like to take a few brief moments to update you on a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to ask that you please continue to keep Mia Pentlicky and her family in your prayers. Mia is recovering at home from back surgery and I know that she and her family would appreciate your continued support. I've also heard that um, Mrs. Bobby Weeks has been taken home from the hospital, and so we ask that you please remember her as she continues to recover from, from being treated for a blood clot in her lung, um, and so please do remember her as well. I have received word from Bonnie Canterbury that her mother, Nancy Whitbread, suffered a stroke and has been recovering from that at Overlook Hospital, so please also remember Mrs. Whitbread in your prayers. And last but not least, it is my great pleasure to announce that Reverend Cooper has given birth to a healthy baby, baby boy, and um, they are home and doing well, so we ask that you rejoice with her and keep her and her family in your prayers as well. We would like to welcome uh, our guest preacher for this Sunday. Um, her name is Samantha Gilmore, and uh, we are so happy to have Miss Gilmore preaching for us today. So, Ms. Gilmore, thank you for being here. Let us now turn our attention to the worship of our Lord. Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Samantha Gilmore and I will be serving as your guest preacher for the day. Uh, I actually went to seminary with uh, Reverend Cooper. We did our Master of Divinity degrees together, so I was happy and, and excited when she invited me to serve as your guest preacher today. Let us enter into a time of worship. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let us pray. Praise and glory to you, Creator, Spirit of God. You make our bread the communion of Christ's body to heal and reconcile and to make us the body of Christ you make our wine the communion of Christ's saving blood to redeem the world. You are truth. You come like the wind of heaven, unseen, unbidden. Like the dawn, you illuminate the world around us. You grant us a new beginning every day. You warm and comfort us. You give us courage and fire and strength beyond our everyday resources. Be with us, Holy Spirit, in all we say or think, in all we do, this and every day. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer, there will be some call and response. So when I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond hear our prayer. Let us pray. Maker of all things, in the beginning you created heaven and earth. In the fullness of time you restored all things in Christ. Renew our world in this day with your grace. Lord, in your mercy, Life of the world, you breathed life into the flesh you created. Now by your spirit, breathe new life into all the children of the earth. Turn hatred into love. Turn guilt into confession and repentance and reconciliation. Turn sorrow into joy and turn violence and war into justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Lover of concord, you desire the unity of all Christians. Set aflame the whole church with the fire of your spirit. Teach us how to disagree Christianly to honor and recognize the dignity and image of God in each person so that we can unite as one, unite us, 
so that we can be faithful witnesses to the world of the love and peace and truth of Christ that can overcome all conflict if we let it. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, through your spirit you supply for our needs. Heal the sick, comfort the distressed, especially those who cannot see or touch their loved ones. Befriend the friendless, especially those who are feeling isolated and alone. Help the helpless who do not know where to turn. Be our comfort and our hope. Lord, in your mercy. Source of peace, your spirit restores our anxious spirits. In our labor, give us rest. In our temptation, give us strength. In our sadness, give us consolation. Lord, in your mercy. God eternal, as you sent the promised gift of the Holy Spirit to the disciples, look upon your church today and open our hearts to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Kindle in us the fire of your love and strengthen our lives for service in your kingdom. And teach us how to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening hymn today will be number 279, Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, number 279. Scripture reading this morning is 1st John chapter 4 verses 7 through 21 listen now to the word of the Lord beloved let us love one another because love is from God everyone who loves is born of God and knows God whoever does not love does not know God for God is love God's love was revealed among us in this way. 
God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in God and God in us because God has given us of God's Spirit and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as God is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from bondage on this Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all of the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of the Lord.
have a lot of compassion for the synagogue leader in our gospel reading today. As someone who likes order and predictability, I understand him. Actually, I have a lot of compassion for the general portrait of religious leaders that, are, that is painted throughout the Gospels. They don't tend to be shown in a great light. Jesus, in particular, is really hard on them. But if you look at what has happened historically to this community, the leaders have good reason to be so concerned about following the letter of the law and speaking out against those who they believe would disregard it. These people of God have been called into a special covenant with God, a committed relationship. And they have been varyingly faithful and not so faithful in that relationship. At one particularly low point, the people's unfaithfulness got so bad that they were exiled from the land that God had brought them to. They were forced to leave their homeland, which was destroyed, and they spent 70 years in captivity before they were finally allowed to return home and rebuild. So of course, <laughs> the leaders want to do everything in their power to make sure that nothing like that will ever happen again. And perhaps the most obvious way to do that is to be sticklers about the law. Some draw the boundaries even further around the law just to be extra careful that everything is followed and there is zero risk of unfaithfulness. They're just trying to fulfill their duty as religious leaders and make sure that everything is right in their community and between their community and God. They just want to know that everything is going to be okay. Is that so much to ask? Jesus is just passing through town on this particular day, so we don't know what the synagogue leader might have heard about Jesus ahead of time when he agrees to let Jesus come and preach. But the leader probably starts holding his breath as soon as Jesus stops in the middle of his teaching and turns his gaze toward someone who has just entered discreetly at the back. A woman who is bent over. She can't stand up straight. It's exhausting. Her back and her neck are never not in pain. She can't reach things, but she also can't ask for help because she knows that nobody wants to help her. It's impossible to find a comfortable position to sleep in, so she hasn't had a good night's sleep in 18 years. But more than her physical discomfort is her disconnection from her community. The only people who she meets eyes with as she walks are children and they have been warned to stay away from her. Her physical state is viewed by most of her community as the result of sin, either her sin or her family's sin. Her condition also makes her unclean, which means that no one is allowed to touch her. No hugs, no shaking hands, no high fives, no passing of the peace for 18 years years. Since her contact with others is so limited, she has become accustomed to being ignored. It's too emotionally exhausting after a while to pay attention to someone whose condition you don't think that you can really do anything about. It's too hard to care when there's no end to the pain. And so people look past her. She becomes a part of the scenery. Today, she walks in at the back like usual, a few minutes late, so she doesn't have to deal with people avoiding her. But before she can make her way to her accustomed pew, the guest preacher calls out to her from the front and beckons her to come over. Scared of what will happen if she doesn't 
obey this man, she slowly makes her way from the back all the way to the front through the parted sea of piercing stares and whispering. It feels like an eternity to get to the front. She can't walk very fast, bent over like that. When she finally arrives, she strains her neck, trying to get a better look at this stranger, afraid of what kind of example he's going to try to make of her. And then he does something unthinkable. He looks her in the eyes. Not in that accidental glance kind of way, not in that kind of piercing way. He actually sees her. He sees her as she is, and he touches her. He lays his hands on her, and he says, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And immediately, she stands up straight for the first time in 18 years, and she begins praising God with tears of joy and disbelief streaming down her face, and the whole crowd rejoices. What was moments ago, fear and suspense, is now a noisy house of worship with shouts of praise, everybody crowding around her, wanting, of course, to quickly move past the 18 years of avoidance, and people start lining up, hoping that maybe Jesus can do something for them, too. The excitement in the room is palpable. Except for one corner where there is one who just cannot allow himself to enjoy, to experience the excitement of this moment. Because what Jesus did was against the law. It's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And setting this woman free from her bondage is work. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. It's not like it's an obscure one that's easy to forget. And so the synagogue leader starts shouting over everybody else's praise, trying to make them stop. He has to get them to quit lining up to stay away from this Jesus who has no regard for the rules that God has set for God's people. Does Jesus think he knows better? Apparently no one is listening because we're told that he has to keep shouting for a while. But he keeps trying, saying there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. He has a point, doesn't he? Jesus could have set this woman free on literally any other day of the week. Why today? Why did Jesus have to do this today? It almost seems deliberate, like he specifically chose to come to worship, to break God's law in front of everyone, and leave the synagogue leader on his own to bring the chaos back into order. What will God think? How can the leader fix this? Jesus responds to the synagogue leader's anger in a way that might make some of us uncomfortable. Our sweet, compassionate Jesus has no patience at all for this leader. He doesn't pull him aside to talk privately. He addresses him and anyone who might be silently agreeing with him right there and then in front of the whole congregation. You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from bondage on this Sabbath day? In other words, don't you understand that if you're going to be technical about it, you break this law every single week. Don't you understand that untying your animals and taking them to get water, that counts as work? So how is it 
that you are okay with breaking the law for the needs of animals, but not for the needs of human beings. This woman has been in pain for 18 years, and you didn't do anything to help her. Instead, you made it worse by excluding her from your community so that she was totally isolated. She felt like she had to come in at the back and remain invisible, lest she be a burden to you. How convenient that somehow God is okay with you breaking the law in a particular way that is convenient for you, but not in this particular way for this woman and these people lining up who are suffering and in need of help. How is it, dear leader, that you have forgotten that the Sabbath is given to us as a gift for our good? How is it, dear leader, that you have forgotten that God's law is given out of love? God's law is given for our flourishing, not for us to anxiously pull our hair out to lose sleep trying to make sure that we don't step one inch over the line for fear of God's punishment. No, we're not meant to follow it blindly without regard for how it impacts real people around us. Real people made in the image of God. Real people created by God who God has called very good. And that includes you. Dear leader, look at what following the law blindly has done to you. Is this anxious, angry, fearful life you're living really what God wants for you? A life that doesn't allow you to celebrate a woman being set free after 18 years of bondage just because it happened on a particular day of the week? A life that makes you want to stop everybody else from celebrating too? A life that leads you to stop your own congregation whose stories of bondage you know better than anybody from seeking their own liberation. Is this the kind of God you worship? The Sabbath was made for humankind. Humankind was not made for the Sabbath. When our rules, our customs, our way of doing things are not serving human flourishing, we ought to take a good look at how we're using those rules and customs. When our rules are leading us to tell people to hang on and wait for their needs to be met later, we ought to take a good look at how we're using them. When our rules are leading us to feel more fear toward God than love for God, more fear or hate toward other people than love for people, we ought to take a good look at how we're using them. God is love. We heard in our first John passage today. It's repeated twice so we don't miss it. This is who God is. God is love. God is not fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Jesus sets the bent over woman free from her bondage in this story, but he is offering the same freedom to the synagogue leader who is also bent over in fear. Fear of the past struggles of his community, fear of the future, fear of God, the one who he is supposed to guide others toward in worship. I don't think it's any coincidence that immediately before Jesus frees this bent over woman from her bondage, Jesus is teaching the parable of the barren fig tree. It goes like this. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? But he replied, sir, let it alone for one more year, 
until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. It's hard to bear any fruit when you're doubled over in fear. You can't see the sunlight. You can't look around you and see what kind of fruit needs bearing. You can't look into people's eyes and see the encouragement of those who believe in you, those people who love you. Jesus is lifting the synagogue leader up and freeing him from his bent over bondage to fear and inviting him to live out of a new orientation. He's not telling him to ignore the past, to pretend that exile never happened. He's not telling him to ignore the law and throw it out like it has nothing to offer. But he is saying, hey, Look at the way you love your animals, the way you care for them unreservedly. You know that God created them and has called you to care for them well. And so you lead them to drink water because water gives life. Every day you do that. Wouldn't this God of yours, who cares so much for the animals, want the same thing for humans? Wouldn't this God of yours want the same thing for you? What if every day was a day for untying humanity from whatever binds them? What if every day was a day for leading people toward what will give them life, abundant life, a life appropriate for a people who worship a God who is love. We are, after all, created in that image, the image of love. You are set free from your bondage. Bind yourself instead to the God who is love, who loves you and who has come to your house of worship today to bring you freedom. Amen. Our closing hymn today will be number 282, Come Down, O Love Divine, number 282.
receive the benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.